The Secret Science Behind Miracles by Max Freedom Long Chapter 5, Part A The Kahuna System and the Three Souls or Spirits of Man To return to our illustration of the measuring stick of the ancient system called the secret, we have been considering the first unit, that of force. The second unit to be measured is that of consciousness, which directs the force. Later, we shall take up the third unit, that of the substance through which consciousness exerts force. If the kahunas were right in their idea that human consciousness is composed of two separate spirits on this level, with a third or superconscious spirit acting as a guardian angel, so to speak, we have in that concept an addition to psychological knowledge which is of such importance as to be hard to estimate. This concept must cause us to reconsider our religious theories of the human soul. If the kahunas are right in stating that we have in us a less, involved, less evolved lower spirit just up from the animal kingdom as well as a more evolved spirit which has long been up out of the animal kingdom, our ideas of salvation will also have to be remodeled. Two salvations will be required, one for each soul because they are of a different level of development. The religious concept of karma and reincarnation will also have to be revised in the same way and for the same reason, that of having to fit the theories to two unequally developed spirits, to say nothing of fitting them to the superconsciousness, which is the oldest and most highly evolved of men's three selves or spirits, in brackets, the amakawa or parental spirit. Under this older and more workable system of psychology, we come to see ourselves in a clearer light, although we trade simplicity for the complication of triplicity of being. In religion, we are accustomed to consider God a triplicity, but we have apparently lost sight of man as a singular triplicity. This complication becomes even clearer and easier to grasp if we keep always in mind the fact that the low or animal spirit in us, the unihippoli, does all the remembering for the man, but has inferior powers of reason. The conscious mind, the conscious mind spirit, or uhani, cannot remember for itself, but can use the full power of inductive reason. In addition to the evidential data to be found in the death prayer, we find other proofs. While modern psychical research has identified the spirits of the deceased only under the classification of poltergeists and ordinary spirits, the information which has been gathered concerning the activities of spirits as a whole shows very plainly that there must be several, several grades of them, each grade having its own voltage and vital force and its own mental abilities or lack of certain abilities. On the other hand, the kahunas have long since classified the several kinds of spirits. As this is quite new to us of the West, and as this classification is of great interest, as well as of great importance, let me list the several ghostly spirits one may meet in the seance room. And then there's a subtitle here and it says kinds of ghosts or spirits listed according to the kahuna lore. Number one, the ordinary normal spirit of one deceased. This spirit is made up of a consciousness and a conscious spirit as in life. It thinks and remembers like any ordinary normal living man. It uses the same forces. Number two, the subconscious spirit of man cut off from 
its conscious companion by some accident or illness before or after death. This spirit remembers very well indeed, but is illogical, having only, only animal-like deductive reason. It responds to hypnotic suggestion. It is like a child and is often a playful poltergeist or noisy ghost. It loves to attend seances and make tables tip. It tries to answer questions, to be a liar. And, oh, let me start the sentence again. It tries to answer questions and usually gives such answers as make it appear to be a liar or worse. It loves to imitate one's deceased relatives. Number three, the conscious mind spirit of man cut off from its companion subconscious spirit before or after physical death. This spirit cannot remember. Therefore, it is a nearly helpless wraith, wandering about aimlessly, sometimes making its presence known, sometimes seen phys psychically, but acting the part of the true lost soul until rescued eventually and paired off again with a subconscious spirit who can furnish it with remembering powers, often with a set of memories of a former life in which the rescued conscious spirit, or Uhani, had no part. Number four, spirits of the superconscious order, including what may be called nature spirits or group souls, after the theosophical terminology. Only vague information is given as to this class of spirits, although it is included it is concluded that they frequently take a hand in the activities of the two lower spirits, the Unihippoli and the Uhani, helping them to do things of a spectacular nature at times. Not until the rediscovery of the Kahuna system of psychology have we had a remotely plausible and satisfying explanation of the phenomena of dual and multiple personality, or of obsessional or split personality types of insanity. It is exciting, therefore, to see how the old system fits in with what we know in such cases. Let me, prevent, let me present some standard data. Case number nine, multiple personality. Preliminary notes. Source books. Outline of Abnormal Psychology by William McDougall, Scribers, 1926, Encyclopedia Britannica, 13th edition, article on multiple personality. The word personality, as used here, is one not too well defined by psychology. Jung, who has followed Freud in his investigations of the complex, describes the word and takes us back to its Latin origin, persona, the mask worn by actors when they change from one character to another in a play. This describes the thing changed in cases of multiple personality. It is the individuality or traits which distinguish one personnel, one human being from another. In describing the changes of personality in a body, little distinction is made between the subconscious and the conscious, these being considered by most investigators to be component parts of personality. Jung, however, leads the way in his work by making the distinction of anima, in brackets, Latin for breath of, or soul, and corrupted in French to animal, close bracket, for the subconscious and persona for the conscious. The correct description of the phenomenon we now need to investigate should be multiple anima and persona instead of multiple personality. 
there are three points which we must watch in the following cases. One, the appearance or disappearance of either the conscious or subconscious alone with corresponding changes in personality. Number two, the appearance or disappearance of both units combined as a pair. Number three, the memories retained by the personalities as they come and go. If the kahuna theory is correct, that the subconscious alone can remember, then by watching memory, we should be able to tell which unit goes or remains. Webster's International Dictionary speaks of this phenomena as an abnormal condition of mind. I prefer to think of it as an abnormal condition of body in which minds come and go, rather than of the various minds involved. Each mind observed is found perfectly normal while in possession of the body, unless lack of memory of its state when out of the body or asleep within it may be considered abnormalities. Let me read that last sentence again. It's each mind observed is found perfectly normal while in possession of the body, unless lack of memory of its state when out of the body or asleep within it may be considered abnormalities. The terms used in describing the elements of consciousness involved and the states of consciousness are a personality cut off from the control of the body and brain is said to be dissociated. The original personality in a body is the primary one and those that come in to replace it are secondary. The personality in temporary control of the body and brain is said to be dominant. While those who have appeared and have gone or who have not yet appeared are said to be latent. In cases of alternating personalities, two personalities only are involved in the change. If there is a reciprocal amnesia, neither personality remembers anything the other did while in possession of the body. If there is not a reciprocal amnesia, one or both may be able to remember what was done in the body during its absence. Under the influence of hypnosis, one or more of these personalities can usually be brought from the latent state and made to answer the questions of the operator. In other words, of the hypnotist. The answers are none too logical as a rule, but they tell such things as could be remembered by any subconscious mind if the memories were stored in it. This phenomenon is not a new one. Down the ages, men have changed personalities or become possessed. This usually refers to conditions of insanity, but not always. Our attention is now to be fixed on cases where insane personalities were not observed. The case. I will condense a few typical cases which McDougall discusses in the source book mentioned. Reverend W. S. Plumer, P-L-U-M-E-R, first described the following case in Harper's Magazine in 1860. Mary Reynolds, a normal girl of 18, was subject to fits for a year. Then, while reading in a meadow one day, she became unconscious. She awoke blind and deaf. This affliction passed in three months. One morning, she could not be awakened. Some hours later, she awoke of her own accord to all seeming a newborn baby. She could, however, 
repeat a few words. Learning with great rapidity, the baby, baby in quotes, began to grow mentally and use the adult brain. In a few weeks, the primary personality came back and the secondary one disappeared. This alternation continued for years, the baby personality growing up in the process. Neither personality, when dominant, had any knowledge or memory of what the other had done while in possession of the body and the brain. Professor Janet, J-A-N-E-T, describes a case in which one of the alternating personalities knew the memories of the other. Felida, F-E-L-I-D-A, began changing personalities at the age of 13. She was an hysterical child, but the secondary personality was very different. The secondary personality could remember all the memories of the primary, but the primary, none of the memories of the secondary. Dr. Morton Prince's most famous study was the Beauchamp case. At 18 years of age, a young lady began changing personalities. This changing continued for years, five personalities being identified in all, each considering itself a separate individual and the mutual memories being a tangle. The childhood of the girl, B, was marked by emotional stresses and nervousness. Matured, she became a nurse and received an emotional shock in the course of a love affair. Suddenly, all her peculiarities became exaggerated. She became ultra-religious. The memory remained unimpaired. But there was a distinct change in characteristics. This change lasted some six years during which time another personality named Sally came and showed her presence only during sleep. At night, the Sally talked through the body and took it on sleepwalking excursions. At the end of the six-year period, there came another emotional shock and a personality called B4 became dominant. This B4 could remember all the events and the life of the original B, but not those of the life of B1. In the following year, B1 and B4 alternated with reciprocal amnesia. Both remembered all that B had done, but knew nothing of the doings of each other. B1 was sickly and mild. Before was more healthy and far more aggressive. Both were very emotional. Dr. Prince used hypnosis on the patient. Under hypnotic influence, another personality was brought to light. It conversed freely. However, this very interesting personality puzzled the investigator. He was inclined to think she was the original bee restored to normal condition and much improved. She resembled both B1 and B4 to some extent, seeming to be a mixture of them and of herself. She is described as a person of even temperament, frank and open in address, one who seemed to be natural and simple in her mode of thought and manner. She had all the memories B, B1 and B4 continued to alternate. B now commanding the memories of B1 and B4. During this time, B1 and B4 seemed at times to partake of the emotional characteristics of each other, trading back and forth. After some years, the original B became dominant and grew healthy and normal. Sally was interesting. She could be contacted in hypnosis and questioned although she would alternate with one of the other personalities and often upset the procedure initiated during hypnotic investigation. 
she considered herself a separate and distinct personality and remembered all the things she had gone through or with the body at night. She said that she had learned what the other personalities, except before, were doing by reading their minds when she found their thoughts interesting. When they were reading a book which she disliked, she stopped reading their minds and amused herself with her own thoughts. She disliked to be one and often forced upon her visual hallucinations and certain minor auto automatisms. At times, she took control of B1's voice. Often, she forced B1 to do things she did not wish to do, such as telling lies. When Sally took over the body, she could not open her eyes. One of the automatic actions she forced on the others was the rubbing of the eyes. In this way, she eventually got her own eyes open and so was able to see and to dominate the whole organism. Her first success in this came in a moment when the then dominant B1 was drowsing, drowsily resting. Thereafter, Sally was able at will to displace B1 in normal as well as in hypnotized states. At such times, B1 returned with no memory of what Sally had been doing with the body. In struggles of will, Sally seemed to be able to paralyze the will of B1, who, although seemingly dominant, was forced to obey orders, much like a hypnotized subject, which resulted in Sally's being able to play practical jokes on B1. Unraveling the knitting was a favorite joke. Neither B1 nor B4 had any memory of Sally or her periods of dominance. Sally could not read the thoughts of B4 and, and could not often force automations on her. This, she said, was because B4 had heard of her and fought against any control. At certain times, when Sally became dominant, she could not get the eyes of the body open, and the skin, deep tissues, and the muscular sense were all in a condition resembling that of the body when asleep. Comment Dr. Prince holds that all the various personalities using one body are split-off parts of the one real personality. His methods of treatment was that of blending two or more personalities to get a dominant third. In this, he was none too successful. Hmm. Professor McDougall, in his study, in brackets, our source book, decides that each personality is a separate monad or entity in itself. None of the psychologists are willing to admit that these personalities can come and go in and out of the body and that the subconscious mind can be used by one or more personalities or changed in the body. My own study of multiple personality data resulted in my accepting the kahuna system of psychology as one better explaining complicated changes which take place. In some cases, which have been reported, a baby, baby in quotes, personality, arrives and becomes dominant. In others, an adult personality comes and brings with it a complete change in health, even a paralyzed limb and a definite memory of a past life in another body. As psychologists and kahunas disagree, let us go on to see what proof we can find that a personality actually can leave a body and return to it. Case number 10. Did the conscious and superconscious minds of General Lee's mother leave the body and return? Preliminary Notes 
This case was reported in The Hollywood Citizen, December 14, 1934, in the Strange As It May Seem daily feature. I take it it can be authenticated by the originator of the feature. In any event, there are many more cases which are perfectly authenticated. The case. Fourteen months before the famous Confederate soldier, General Robert E. Lee, was born, his mother seemingly died. The doctors found that her heart had stopped beating and that she had turned stiff and cold. Thinking she was dead, funeral services were held, and her body was placed in the family vault. Fortunately, in those parts at that time, bodies were not embalmed. A week later, the keeper of the cemetery went into the vault to remove withered floral offerings and was startled to hear a moan from inside the casket. Hurriedly, he opened the coffin Inside it, he found Mrs. Lee, back again in her body, alive. Apparently, she had but then returned, for she had not smothered. She recovered and lived to give birth to the son, who was later to become so famous. Comment in this and many similar cases, we have proof of the cessation of all activities of the conscious mind in the body. Those of the subconscious all but ceased. To account for absence of decay in the body, we are forced to conclude that there was a slight connection, perhaps by an ectoplasmic thread between the body and the subconscious which must have been partly removed because of the death-like state of the body. In this connection, it's well to remember the yogis of India. These holy men used some form of auto-suggestion to throw their bodies into a death-like state while the conscious mind goes away for long periods of time and the subconscious becomes dormant and the subconscious becomes dormant. In, in the two cases that we have just examined, there are data which will later be of value. But in the next two, we will come upon the data which finally showed me the significance of all data, pointing me to the secret of secrets of the kahunas. And that concludes the first part of this chapter. Now I've read ahead in the next uh, part of this chapter. It's absolutely fascinating. But it is a long chapter and that's why I've, I've uh, separated it into two parts. So, till soon.